Right, so without further ado, it's now five minutes past, we'll get into this lecture. Now this lecture is called Digital Design and Race Times. And I know for a fact I'm not going to be able to get onto race times because I didn't last year. So they're at the beginning of next lecture. So I fully expect us to get all the way through this but not, not cover this. And we'll do this next lecture. So quite a quick recap of last lecture. Um, so this lecture really builds on what we've been doing before. So last lecture I taught you how to effectively um, interpret uh, or, or figure out the truth table from any digital circuit. I said what you do is you basically get the the input, you write the truth table, so you just write all the input, possible combinations of inputs to your circuit out. So you go, um, you know, we have input A, input B, and you just basically count them in binary. So you go 0, 0, which is 0, 0, 1, which is 1, 1, 0, which is 2, 1, 1, which is 3. And then you just shove these inputs onto the inputs of your circuit. Then you use your brain to basically compute what's going to happen with the circuit. So if we shove a 1 and a 0 onto an OR gate, we get a 1 out. If we shove a 1 into a NOT gate, we get a a zero out, and we write that in our truth table. So like this, we can, build, we can understand any circuit. So there's the full truth table. And we looked at some quite complicated examples. And the example I got you to play with in the class was this XOR, uh, this XOR circuit, where, <coughs> where um, <coughs> it had sort of two AND gates, two NOT gates, and an OR gate. And I said, this is an XOR gate, and it's used in lots of computational circuits. And you all seem to get the hang of that quite easily. Any questions so far? Any burning questions? Do, do just shout out. If, there's something you, if you don't understand, you're lost. Just say I don't understand, because I'm really happy to go over stuff again. Absolutely delighted to do it. Then we looked at loops. Um, we looked at, sorry, um, we looked at uh, latches. And we looked at this little circuit here, where basically it's got a feedback loop. So here's, the input, here's an input, and we've got sort of the output being fed back into the OR gate. And we know that effectively, whenever an OR gate has got a 1 going into it, the output will be 1. So what happens is when we put a 1 on the input of an OR gate with a, with a feedback loop, the 1 propagates through the OR gate, then goes back round to the, the beginning, and then we've got this sort of eternal loop of 1 being propagated through um, our OR gate. And then no matter what we do to the input, so you can see we're going from a, from a 0 to a 1, from a 0 to a 1, the output always stays 1 because we've got this loop, this 1 being fed back continually. I said the only way to fix this, or to sort of, the only way to, and, uh, this circuit is effectively remembered that at some point in the past a 1 was present on the input. So this is a very, very simple memory element. And I said, what we need to do really is to be able to store 1s or zeros, not just 1s. And the only way we can sort of reset this circuit or tell it now to remember a zero is to effectively put a switch in the feedback loop. So kill the feedback, and then there's no longer a one going round in this circle, and the output will be set to a zero. <coughs> and I said a rather sort of fancy way of doing this is with this circuit here. And I said, don't worry about the circuit in detail. Excuse me. <coughs> Don't worry, about the, don't worry about the circuit in detail. Um, but what you can see is we've got gates we recognize. We've got AND gates, NOT gates, um, another, another NOT gate. And we can see some feedback loops. And we sort of analyzed this circuit in some detail last week. And we said it was a JK flip-flop. And we can sort of hide, hide all of this complicated working effectively in this, whoops, in this box, which is called a JK flip-flop. And a JK flip-flop has got the inputs J and K and the outputs Q and Q bar. And I said that Q, something bar always means the opposite of it um, in electronics. So 1 is 1, but 1 bar is 0, because the bar always means opposite of. <coughs> um, and I said this is basically a, an incredibly simple uh, memory element, and you'll find it in lots of computers and things. There's lots of other, in fact, there's a whole zoo of memory elements that you'll use. So, you know, um, you know, uh, USB sticks have different memory elements, and you might have different el memory elements optimized for speed or power use or, or wh whatever. But this is all a very useful memory element to learn to design digital circuits for you guys, and you'll, it's practically useful in your projects. So when you want to store a 1 on a JK flip-flop, what you do is you put a 1. So this is a memory element. We put a 1 on the input on the J pin. We then put a 0 on the K pin. And then what we do is we apply a clock pulse. And when this clock pulse goes from 0 to 1, what happens is this JK flip-flop says, right, I now need to remember what is on the input. So it memorizes that there's a, a 1 on the input, and so a 1 on the J and a 0 on the K. And then, it, then on the output pin of Q, it sticks a 1. 
then whatever you do to the input of this JK flip-flop, it will not do anything at all, nothing at all, because it's busy remembering this one. This circuit is remembering this one, so it's showing you a one on the output. And only when you put a zero and a one on the input, so we're now going back to zero, and you, this is a magic step, and you apply that clock pulse, boom, does the JK flip-flop go, ah, I now need to remember what's on the input. So then what it does is it goes, right, I need to remember this zero and this one. So the zero goes to the output, and then, again, no matter what you do to the input, so you can do anything to the inputs you want, the JK flip-flop output will not change until you apply that clock pulse again because it's busy remembering that zero, okay? So whatever it's remembering is always on the output pin Q. Any questions so far? Nope? Okay. So you can basically sort of totally understand this flip-flop by looking at the truth table, which I think comes up in a moment. So this is the truth table. So this is something I'd expect you to remember for an exam. It's sort of a basic fundamental digital building block. So the next topic, so I just want to recap that because I wanted everybody to really remember um, what was in last lecture because we're about to use it. And it is, I, I always hate it when you sort of, you're not quite sure it was in the last lecture because it was a long time ago. And then you can't understand what's in this lecture. So that's why I do these mini recaps. How are we doing for time? Ages. Just check the real time. <coughs> right. So I'm now going to slow down a bit. Um, right. So this is an SR motor. Can you hear me at the back, by the way? Can you hear me? In the white shirt, can you hear me? Yeah, good. I've just pinned it on here. I'm fed up holding it. Um, so this is an SR motor. Now, no Arthur's been teaching about motors, but this is a particularly nice type of motor to drive with electronic circuits because it's quite simple to drive, and you can quite accurately control the angle. So has Arthur been teaching about stepper motors? Yeah? Yeah, you've been doing stepper motors. This is a bit like a stepper motor, except it's a bit more simple to drive because the pole in it isn't magnetic. It's just an iron bar. And it just makes the, the, the digital circuit a bit easier to drive it. And you can basically move this, this iron bar around by turning on and off the coils. So at the moment in this picture, what we've done is we've got a battery and we've applied a voltage between, well, basically through this coil. So the, the current goes all the way through there, around there, around there, and there's some magic wire linking it behind to join it up here. So we've just got current flowing through this coil, and the bar is attracted. It's basically sort of stuck between these two poles. Then what happens is we change where we apply the voltage. So instead of applying the voltage between here and here, we apply it between here and here, and the bar is sort of sucked round between the next poles, and it moves. And then if again we, we apply a voltage between, well, we, we energise this coil, the bar sort of spins round to the next position. And you can sort of see that by changing which coil is on and which, and which coils are off, you can quite accurately control this bar and spin it round. And here I've only given you uh, t uh, one, two, three poles, but you'd have sort of mul multiple poles. And it's a, bit, it's a bit like a step motion. You can get quite accurate control over, over um, position. And there we go. So it's sucked around the beginning, back there, back there, back there. Back there. Get the idea? Yeah? C nods? Good. Now, it's good. This is a good motor, and it's quite, it's quite a fun motor to play with if you ever have one. But you're like, what? You're saying, what has this got to do with digital electronics? Why is this man telling me about motors in digital electronics? This is Arthur's domain. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be telling me about this. Now, there's a funny link between this motor and our serial to parallel converter from last week that will become very clear in a moment. So here is our serial to parallel converter from last week. Now let's just very quickly recap how it works. So basically we have the data coming from the computer in a serial stream, so one bit after the other along a piece of wire. So the wire will transmit a zero or one, there's one, there's zero, but that's not how our computers or devices like data. Our computers don't like data in serial, so one bit after another. They like the data nicely spread out on a series of wires, so it's sort of like, like basically binary counting. So what this will do, this device, is will take a string of ones and zeros coming in here, and I sort of make them parallel, sort of split them up into different, different, different lines. And this is how it works. So we put a one on, our, on the input, and what happens? So what do you think we're going to do with these JK flip-flops? We've just put information on it. What are we going to do? At the back, something back. What are we going to do to make you remember it? Clock. I hear the word clock. We're going to clock it, right? So we put a one on the input to this JK flip-flop. 
and we then apply a clock pulse, bang, whoops, oh sorry, my point's a bit funny from over here. I've done like five slides. We've got a one, we then clock it. So what happens is this JK flip-flop will remember this one, okay? And it will put this one on the output here. This JK flip-flop will remember whatever's here and put whatever's here on this output here. This JK flip-flop will remember whatever's here and put whatever's here on this output here. And this JK flip-flop here will remember whatever's here and put whatever is there on the output here. So what we do by applying the clock pulse is we basically shuffle, we've remembered this one, and we sort of shuffled all the data along, 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 our, S, along our JK flip-flops, and this is called a shift register. So now we put a zero on our JK flip-flop, we apply a clock pulse, boom. So what's gonna happen is this JK flip-flop is going to remember what's there, which is a zero, and it's gonna put a zero on the output. This JK flip-flop will remember what's there, and put, a zi put whatever's there on the output. This one will remember what's there, and put whatever's there on the output. This one will remember what's there, and put this on the output. So it will look like this. And can you see, we've now, we've now basically shuffled a one and a zero along our shift register. And we're gonna repeat this again and again and again. So we can sort of take any data there and sort of display it on, on our series of light bulbs here. <clears throat> so let's do it again. We, go, we put a one on the input, apply the clock pulse, all the data shuffles along, put a zero on the input, apply a clock pulse, all the data shuffles along. Any questions? Shout. You didn't get it. Who, who, who would like me to go over this again? Hands up, who wants me to go over this again? Who doesn't want me to go over this again? Mm, okay. <laughs> I think, well, what will happen is in the next, I think more people understand it than don't. In the next, we're doing another example in a minute and it'll become quite clear about what, what goes on. So I'll ask the question again in a minute, and if, if it's still not clear, I'll repeat. So the idea of this is basically, it takes data in there, and it displays it in parallel on these lines here. Now then, what does this have to do with this? Well, let's have a look. Firstly, let's switch on one JK flip-flop. Well, the question is, how, whoops, the question is, how can we make this circuit here drive this motor? Well, let's think about this. Firstly, let's just switch on one JK flip-flop. So we've got a one here, okay? Now, our motor here has three poles. It's got one pole here, one pole here, and one pole here. Okay, we've got four flip-flops. So let's get rid of one flip-flop. Boom, okay? Now, this is the clever bit. What we're gonna do is we're gonna connect this output here all the way back to this input here, like this. Boom. So, what will happen when we clock this flip-flop is this bit here, this one, <coughs> will get shuffled along to here, and then the next time we clock it, this one will get shuffled along to here. And when it gets to the end, it's gonna go all the way back round to the beginning. So we've made, made like a sort of a one, a shuffle along our registers, and then back to the other side. So if we replace our light bulbs, so you see we've got light bulbs here, if we replace our light bulbs with coils of the motor, so here I've got this, the, the red coil is this coil here, the green coil is this coil here, the blue coil is this one here. So at the moment, our JK flip-flop is basically attached to this coil of the motor, and it's energized, right? So when, what happens when we clock our array of flip-flops is this flip-flop here sees this one on its input and transfers it to its output and remembers this one. This JK flip-flop sees this zero on its input and transfers it to here. And this JK flip-flop here sees this zero, because it's connected away around there, on its input and transfers it to there. So what happens is we shuffle along our one on the shift register. And because now this flip-flop is on, um, this pole is energized and we've dragged our, 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 our motor around by 30 degrees or so. So then what happens when we apply another clock pulse is basically this bit gets shuffled along the shift register again because this, this JK flip-flop sees a one on its input and shuffles it along. So apply, apply another clock pulse, all the bits jump, boom. And now this blue coil is turned on and our motor has rotated yet again. So we're now using a shift register um, or which was initially a digital to serial converter, we've changed it into a shift register, to drive the poles of our motor. And then this is the really wonderful bit, 
because we've connected the output of this JK flip-flop all the way around to the input of this JK flip-flop. Um, when we apply another clock pulse, this one goes all the way around here, and our, our red solenoid or our red coil gets turned on again. So we sort of captured this bit in a loop forever. And we, we can do it again, and, uh, whoops, and, we, and we can do it as many times as we want. Uh, so I'll just run through the animation again. Whoops, my point is a bit crazy. I think it got wet. Right, so we'll just watch this animation. So we go, this is on, clock it, the bit jumps to there. Clock it again, the bit jumps. Clock it again, the bit jumps. Clock it again, the bit jumps. And you can see the motor rotating as you clock it. Any questions about this? Any questions? Anyone want me to go over anything again? Is it a bit clearer now? No. <laughs> How about the back? Somebody, is there a hand there at the back? You right with it? Yeah, good, okay. Okay, well you've got to shout. If you've got any questions, just shout, and I'll very happily answer them. Okay, so I think you've probably got to work through this with pen and paper at home and just, yeah, one, one specific question, go for it. What's the one specific question? That's, I love specific questions, because then I, I know what's not, not going right. Yes. Yeah, I'll repeat your question. It. I'll, I'll repeat, just say your question, I'll repeat it so they can all hear. Yeah. It shifts. Ah. Right. That's a subtle question. It's because you've basically turned on one, one JK flip-flop and it's remembering a bit and then the other one sees the, the, the bit on the previous flip-flop and so it's, it's always transferring the, the bit between the memory elements. Okay? Right. Okay. Any other questions? No? Nope. Right. Ah, oh, my crazy point. I've got to get a new one. Right, so that was the end of flip-flops, really. And what we'll do in the examples class is we'll run over um, design it, designing some circuits with flip-flops. So, in the first couple of lectures, we learned about AND gates, OR gates, NOT gates, and XOR gates. And we also made some pretty simple circuits involving AND and OR gates. Now, very often, um, you can probably guess if you've got a prob specific problem you want to solve, you can probably guess how to connect AND and OR gates together to give you some binary, some binary circuit to do what you want. But very often, um, you've got a very complex problem with multiple inputs, so maybe 10 inputs, and you need a methodology, like a methodology that will always work to design a digital circuit for you. And what I'm going to do in the next sort of 10 minutes or so is teach you a methodology to turn a truth table or a problem into a set of gates reliably. This will always work, no matter whatever problem you come up, up against. And it's incredibly powerful. And we can, we're actually going to use it to design parts of a computer after this, uh, in, in the last section of this lecture. So, let's look at a real engineering problem. Imagine you're designing a circuit to monitor the um, uh, temperature, uh, a, a thermometer embedded inside a nuclear reactor. So I wrote this slide at the time um, Fukushima went up. So it's quite topical then. So you've got a thermometer in this nuclear reactor, okay? Now, you want the, if all this water in the nuclear reactor boils off, then the, the rods get exposed and they get very, very hot and then it goes bang and it's bad, generally speaking. Um, so you've got to keep this water basically below boiling, otherwise um, you'll lose it and then the, the reactor goes bang. So generally you want the reactor to shut off if the temperature of this water goes above 50 degrees. Otherwise, this happens, which isn't good. Okay. So let's, we've got a thermometer. So here I've got a thermometer, and I've sort of simplified this problem. Very often from on these thermometers, you might get 10 bits spit, spat out or something. That will give you a very, very high resolution of temperature. But because I want to go for lunch at some point, I've cut it down to three bits. So we'll be able to do this problem in the next, uh, you know, five minutes. So this thermometer here gives three outputs, O1, O2, and O3. So here are the outputs, O1, O2 and O3. And wh what's this pattern here? Have you recognize it? Binary. It comes up all the time. So this is binary 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now, the thermometer is quite a crude thermometer. 
gives or corresponding to this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, the temperature is either 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70. And we want to design our circuit to cut off the nuclear reactor, or just to stop it, when the temperature goes above 50 degrees C. So we want our circuits to generate some type of special output for the case when we go have 60 degrees or 70 degrees. Okay. So here's a picture of our problem. We've got a nuclear reactor that we want to shut off. We've got a thermometer that's giving us three inputs. And we need to design basically some digital circuitry to go in this box. And this is actually called glue logic and glues together things. So in this case, we're gluing together thermometer and nuclear power station. And very often, when you're designing loads of pieces of equipment, you need some like glue logic. It's sort of simple logic that just sticks, makes two pieces of kit talk. And this is a very, very, very off common engineering problem that you'll have to just draw on the back of a cigarette packet and find the answer. So here are special cases. <coughs> ah. And the nuclear reactor, I've said, it's got this input called S, which means shut down. Okay? So here's our full truth table. Here is the input from a thermometer in binary. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And here's the output we want our circuit to give us. So temp all temperatures below, 50 or below 60 degrees, we want the reactor to stay on. But when this temperature creeps above uh, 50 degrees, we want our circuit to change its output from a 0 to a 1 and tell the reactor to shut down. So it's this bit here that's telling the reactor to shut down or not. Okay. So we're now going to design a circuit to basically spit out at uh, 0 degrees, 0, 10 degrees, 0, 20 degrees, 0, 30 degrees, 0, 40 degrees, 0, 50 degrees, 0, 60 degrees, 1, 70 degrees, 1. So this means shut down. So firstly, let's try and construct a circuit that um, will shut or produce a 1 when it has three inputs, 1, 2, and 3. Now, we're doing this first because it's incredibly easy. So all we do is we get AND gate, just a simple AND gate. This AND gate's got three inputs, and very often you have AND gates with 100 inputs. But this one's only got three inputs. And what we do is we connect the output of thermometer 1, 2, and 3, so these are the outputs of the thermometer, to the inputs of the AND gate, and we can see that when this is on, this is on, this is on, so all inputs of the AND gate are on, the output will be 1 because it's an AND gate, and the output to our circuit S will be 1. So we've designed half the circuitry to our circuit. So now let's look at the next problem. We now want to design a circuit that produces a 1 when the output 1 thermometer is on, the output 2 of the thermometer is on, and output 3 of the thermometer is off. So we just go and do that. So here's another circuit. And this circuit will produce a 1 only, only when input 0 is 1, input 2 is on, and input 3 is off. And the way we've done this is we've inserted, we've slotted in a NOT gate before um, the, so between the output through the thermometer and the input of the AND gate. So in this condition, this will be on, this will be on, this will be off, but the NOT gate is inverted. So this is on now, so we've got three 1s going into our AND gate, and we'll produce a 1 on the output. Okay? So now what we've got OK, so let's do one more, just to hammer the point home. Presumably, it's bad if the water in our nuclear reactor freezes. I don't know, but presumably, it is bad. So let's also cut it off when the water freezes. And where we can do this is, again, we use an AND gate. And we want the condition, we want a one, our circuit to produce a 1 when, we, when it has a 0, a 0, and a 0 going into the AND gate. So here's, here's the input, here's the output from our thermometer. We have O1, O2, and O3. So in this, in this state, we've got 0, 0, and 0. But because they're all going to not gates, we get 1, 1, and 1, and our AND gate will be 1. OK? So now we've, we've solved this problem. So we've got three circuits now that will all spit out 1s in the specific conditions when we want them to spit out 1s. OK? Now then, we're almost there. We've just got to do a little bit of joining stuff together, and we're done. And so what we do is, firstly, we couple together all the, all the, basically, all the O, all the, all the O zeros from our gates together, all the O two small gates together, and all the O three small gates together. This means the output thermometer gets put onto all of our circuits at the same time. Okay, so they all see what the thermometer is giving us. Okay. Problem is now we've got three outputs. So we've got an output here, an output here, 
and output here. And all we do now to finish off the circuit is literally just couple out all the outputs together with a single OR gate and we're finished. Okay? That's it. So now we've made this circuit to spit out this truth table. And this will work with any problem, any problem you might encounter. So um, here's a truth table. So I'm going to recap. I'm going to recap, and our, our nuclear reactor will no longer blow up. So what I'm going to do is now recap these steps just very, very quickly, and then I think we're going to have a go at doing this ourselves. So the first step is draw the truth table, okay? Step number one. Step number two, write little circuits with not gates and AND gates that will produce a one at the conditions you want a one to be produced, okay? Step two, couple the input, or step three, couple the inputs together, slap an OR gate on the output, and you're done. That's it. That is the methodology you can use to design any, any, any binary circuit, okay? Now, you can actually actually design, with this tool, with this very, very simple tool, you can actually now almost design parts of chips. And, you know, you can design addition units for chips, so bits that add numbers together in chips. You can design units that um, divide numbers in chips. So you could imagine, for example, you know, you could have maybe, I don't know, instead of having, uh, you have 01, 02, and 03, which is one number, you could then have 04, 05, and 06, which is another number, and then you could work out what, what this circuit would have to look like. So when those inputs were put onto your circuit, it produced them added together. And that's all computers do, really. They're just sort of very well-defined digital circuits. So uh, let me just have a look through what we've got coming up. Oh, postponed. Four hours. I want to reboot my computer. That's bad. Right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a go at designing um, an addition unit. Or you're going to have a go at designing an addition unit for a computer. Right. So, no, we're not going to do that because that's a massively complicated problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I wanted you to get, get you to do that, but then I decided um, you can't do that in a lecture. So what you could do, as I said, is you could use basically these same tools to design units that would add together the numbers A and B and produce a binary output of C. But instead of doing that, what we're going to do is produce a circuit that um, detects if a number is odd. Yes. So this, we, what I want you to do is design a circuit to detect if a number is odd, OK? So 0 isn't odd, 1 is odd, uh, 2 isn't odd, 3 is odd. 4 isn't odd, 5 is odd, so I want you to design now, just scratch down a piece of paper, a circuit that will produce, effectively tell you whether or not a, a binary number is odd or not odd. Okay, so an odd or even detector, effectively. So, really, sorry? Is 2 an even number? No, yes, 2 two's an even number. So just have a go at that. Have a, have a quick scribble, see if you can get the circuit. So what I want you to do is basically write down an AND gate that will make each one of these go high. And then I want you to couple it all together, an OR gate and couple the inputs together. And if you, if you do it, it'll help you in the exam and the examples class. If you don't do it, um, I don't mind. So just have a quick scribble. So the steps are write the AND gates out. So you want to write the AND gates out, couple together the inputs, and couple together the outputs. So you want to basically, oh, I can't do it from here. Yeah. That's it. How's it? Go for it. I won't give you long. I'm going to give you like two minutes. Oh, it's looking good there. So you don't need to write out the table because I've written out the table for you already. Just go, I'd go straight for the gates. How are we doing here? Looking good. Which one's that? First one, yeah? You got 25% you got mark so far. <laughs> How are we doing here? Let's see what are you doing. How are we, not, not yet, OK. A little bit more time, maybe. Yeah. So you want some not gates there. So we should, I should be starting to see some um, 
some, uh, some AND gates with some NOT gates going into them. So it should look, I should start to see some gates that look a bit like this, but obviously optimized for your truth table. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's coming later. Okay. So have a, have a go with this. We've got, we've got a guy who's done it in his head already. But we'll... Uh, how are we doing here? Okay. Let's have a look. There's a hand up there. Don't spoil it for everybody. I know what you're going to say. Don't spoil it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, looking good, looking good. Let's have a go. How are you doing here? Ah, not. Okay, who's got the right Oh, we've got half it going there, that's good. Who's got the right answer so far? Who's, who thinks they've finished? Maybe you think they've. Oh, you, you think you finished? Oh, go on, let's see. Ah. Uh, Yes, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I'd like you to do it the proper way. Okay, so I've seen quite. What I've seen is quite a few AND gates scratched out. Yeah. Okay, looking good. You've got almost half it there. So you want some NOT gates in there? Yeah. Okay. How are you doing here? Okay. Right. So you've all had a go, or at least if you haven't had a go, you've had a chance to have a go. So what I'm going to do now, now a few people pointed this, that, that looks brilliant, that looks, that looks absolutely fantastic, yeah, 100%. If I had a prize, I'd give you a prize. So, lot, quite a few people had a go at this, and quite a few people have had a go at writing, writing this out. Now the correct answer is this. Um, so what we've done is we basically, each one of these gates here basically turns on for one of these outputs here. And we've coupled together the inputs, we've coupled together the output with not all gates, and it's sorted. Now then, some people noticed this about the problem. Some people, there's a guy there and a guy there, who thought, well, actually, I'm detecting odd numbers, right? Now, I know, or I've noticed that the third bit here always goes high when it's an odd number, right? Because the third bit always represents a one, okay? And numbers with a one sort of that have a bonus one, are divisible, uh, uh, odd. So for example, this is one, that's odd. Two doesn't have this bit set. Oh, three, so this is, one number, this is three, one is, this, this bit's high with three. And also, uh, this is, so what's this, uh, three, four, five, this bit is set for five. So you, some, some people notice this correlation between this bit here being set and this bit here being high. Okay, so people notice this correlation just by looking at the circuit, which sort of suggests what we can do is we can just connect bit three to the output of S, and we've solved, uh, we've solved our problem. So basically, if we just connect bit three to S, when this is high, it's odd. 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 So you see there's like a sort of a mental shortcut that you can take. Now, what this tells us is this wonderful circuit here that people started drawing isn't the optimal solution, okay? It's a solution, it will work, and the method I just taught you to draw this circuit will work 100% of the time. So if you do this method of draw drawing the AND gates, like all the AND gates for all the ones you want, arranging the NOT gates, coupling together the outputs with the OR gates, coupling together the inputs, you will always arrive at a circuit that will work. This will give you a correct answer, always, okay? It look messy, you use lots of gates, but you'll always get the correct answer. But very often, there's a simpler way to arrive at the correct answer. Um, using, uh, and if you're an electronic engineer, I'll teach you a whole load of minimization techniques to sort of go from a truth table like this to sort of a minimal circuit that will always work. But I'm not going to. All I'm going to say is there's software packages to turn truth tables like this into sort of minimum, minimum circuits that you can use. And you can download these off the internet, and they'll spit out sort of optimum circuits for you. Now, I, I've taught you this method with the AND and OR, or gates because it always works. But in industry, if you get a big problem like this, go and download a package that will just do it for you really quickly.
that will produce the minimum solution. Um, yeah, so the other thing I want to say, this is like an industry tip, basically. I've introduced you previously to these and and or gates like in packages and they look like this. And these are pretty handy and you can buy them for you know, 20p for your project. Brilliant, you know, you can make, make some bit of the glue logic, very easy. But when you get to industry, what you'll, you won't be using these because these are sort of 1970s technology, even though they are still used and are still in products today. What you'll be using for sort of complex problems are things like this, they're called FPGAs, or uh, Programmable Field Gate Arrays. And they cost about a tenner each, okay? And inside of them, they've got literally millions of AND and OR gates and NOT gates. So what you can do is you can design your circuit um, using some type of computer program like this. And you can download it to this chip. And what this chip will actually do is physically connect with wires and or a NOT gates to represent your circuit. So you sort of, it's like a sort of a, a soft programmable circuit. You have re real circuit elements that are connected together when you tell them to be connected together. And they're very, very handy. I mean, I'm not going to test you on this, but um, you know, if somebody says FPGA, that's what it is. It's like a, a chip with millions of AND and OR gates to um, have really complicated digital circuits in. So they're quite handy if you go to industry. Um, how are we doing for time? Oh, I think we've got time to do this. So I've got, I've got 10 minutes. I'm going to teach you something about called race times. Um, <coughs> so what I would like you to think about is I'd like you to think about this circuit. I'd like you to think about this circuit here. So we've got on the inputs to this circuit the numbers 1, 1, and then all of a sudden... For some reason, the input to this circuit changes to 0, 0. Okay? So let's draw this circuit out. Whoops. Ah, I think my pointer hates me. Okay. So let's, let's draw this circuit out in detail. So we've got 1, 1 here. We've got a 0 here. We've got a 1 here. And we've got a 1 on the output. Here, we've got um, a 0 here, a 1 here. This is a little 0. And we've got a 1 on the output. So let's draw out this situation of changing from a, from a 1 to 1 to a 0 and 0. Um, I've done this on a timing diagram. And I introduced timing diagrams last lecture. I said it's just a nice way to represent inputs and outputs to a circuit um, in, in a sort of easy way. So here we've got the input A, and here's the input B. And at this time, we drop the input A, and we drop the input B. So we're now 0 and 0, so 0 here and 0 here. Now, instantaneously, so I've labelled this output of the NOT gate A bar. Instantaneously, as we drop A, boom, what happens is we raise A bar because the, the input to A has gone from a 1 to a 0, which means the NOT gate switches on. So we're basically switching on the NOT gate, and NOT gate goes, whoop, on. And what you see is that basically we've always got a 1 on the output of our circuit because what happens is as... As we go at 1, 1, we have a 1 going to our circuit here and a 0 here. But when we, sw when we sw uh, swap the outputs, or swap the inputs, the NOT gate sort of takes up the slack, puts in a 1 to our circuit, and this 0 doesn't matter, so the output's 1. And what we have as a result is effectively the output of our circuit always being high, OK? So if we put 1, 1 or 0, 0 in our circuit, the output's high. Get it? So far? Do you understand the circuit? Yes? No? Yeah? The man in the pink shirt is nodding. That's a good sign. So basically, it's a very simple circuit and will always be on when we put 1, 1 or 0, 0 into the circuit. Now, this is, a ma this is an imaginary um, circuit which doesn't actually exist, and I'll show you, tell you why. Because everything takes time to react, right? I mean, you know, if I say, I don't know, pick up a pencil to you or something, you won't do it instantaneously. You've got to go and get the pencil pick it up. It's the same with electronic gates. When you say, when you change the inputs to a gate, electrons has got, have got to sort of flow in the internal circuit of the gate. You know, the uh, capacitor's got to charge, charge has got to get there, it's got to turn on, you know, all things like that. And the, and the thing is, these, these circuits, or any digital circuit, doesn't react instantly. There's a finite amount of time from when you say switch on to when it's on. So, for example, with this NOT gate, when you go from a, when the input goes from a 1, to a zero, 
there's this finite time tau where the output goes from a zero to a one. And this is called, effectively, a turn-on time. And you see this with any electro electrical component, so transistors, you know, anything that turns on takes a time to turn off. You know, think, think of an incandescent light bulb. When you switch the switch in the room for it to turn on, there's a finite time where it starts to warm up and then it, the light's on. It's just the same with these devices. Very quick, you're talking about, I don't know, microsecond, maybe in a really expensive one, a few nanoseconds, but it is a time. It is a time for it to switch on. So that, now, let's now look at a more realistic timing diagram of this circuit. <coughs> so what happens with this circuit is the inputs one and one, so one and one, we then make the input zero and zero, and this not gate sees a zero on its, on its input, and then it starts to turn on. It goes, oh, there's a zero on it, my input, I must start to turn on. And a certain time later, the not gate's actually turned on. But because we've got this delay, there's a finite time between the not gate turning on and the input to the circuit um, going off. And we can see because of this, we get this dip in the output. So for a finite amount of time, all the inputs to our OR gate are actually zero. So our circuit will produce a zero for a very, very short amount of time. And this is called a race time, because you can think of electrical signals racing through a circuit as you've changed them. So if you look at this, electrical signal coming in here, going to the OR gate, will get straight there. But electrical signal coming in from this A won't get straight to the OR gate, because it's got to go through another really slow component, a NOT gate. So there'll be this delay. And this is why it's called race time. So you can think of sort of electrons racing through circuits like horses and getting delayed by gates on the way. Now, your thing. But if, if the output of this circuit is joined to, like, I don't know, a detonator of a nuclear warhead, you don't want the output being wrong, even for a little amount of time. Okay? <laughs> so this can be quite a serious problem. And very often, you'll design big, complex digital circuits, and you'll find out that they don't work or they're wrong for a little bit of the time because of these race times and the sort of complex software packages that can help you analyze these, these issues um, when you get to industry. Um, and you know, say, oh, watch out about this. And you, you know, there's various ways to cope with it. But it's something I just want you to be aware of because when you, when, you know, when you have a circuit that's not performing or is doing odd stuff, this can be a reason because your, your elements are not ideal. Okay. I think 